here and then this talk will be recorded and it will be posted on the archaeological research facility YouTube site so you can revisit it if you want. Um, my name is Meg Conkey and I am introducing uh, the speaker as well as contributing a little bit to the talk. Uh, this evening, we're delighted to have George Michel here. It is his last but best stop on a cross-US lecture tour. He uh, began with at the New York City Consulate at the beginning of October, and then he went to Harvard University, and then he went to the University of Pennsylvania, then he went to the University of Chicago, and now he has come to Berkeley, which of course is when you have the last stop is the best. Uh, the talk is today is uh, sponsored by the Archaeological Research Facility, obviously, and also for the Institute for South Asian Studies on campus, as well as the Department of Anthropology. And I want to thank especially the Archaeological Research Facility with um, Sarah, uh, Kanza, Nico, and Millie for helping with the uh, reception, as well as making sure that the project and talk is going to work because we always have those kind of technological challenges. So just a few words about George, um, who if you ask any colleague of his or look at any website, it would say that he is a world renowned architectural historian, especially of India. He received his PhD in 1974 from the University of London and it's been temple architecture ever since then, as well as many other subjects. If you are looking to have a generous library, maybe a six foot shelf of books, they could all be by or with George Michel. He has written on Hindu temples, Islamic architecture of the Deccan, Mughal architecture, the Elephanta Cave of Shiva, princely Rajasthan, and I could go on and on, in addition, of course, to the work that he and with colleagues, and uh, including John Fritz, have written about Humpy or the amazing side of the Gianagra. George is a founder and a trustee of the Deccan Heritage Foundation and um, is hoping to bring some projects to a close, but I can't imagine George without a project. So, you know, that's his. The other thing about George is that he is a dedicated cellist and very much involved in all things of writing an innovative new book on J.S. Bach. So we have many um, arrows to his, uh, whatever it's called. Oh. You put your <laughs> arrows in, quiver, that's what it is, right? <laughs> now, I could go on about George and I won't because what you did was you came here to hear from him. But George did ask me to say a few things about John Fritz's career that brought John to the point that he and George got together and did the work that George will talk about. Uh, and this is primarily sort of oriented to our um, anthropological and archeological members of the audience, um, just to put him in context as to when he sort of was really ready, if you will, to engage with the kind of work that went on um, at Viginagra. John was an undergraduate at the University of Chicago, and he happened to be there at a time when there was a major dynamic change happening in anthropological archaeology in uh, North America. He had taken a class from a archaeologist named Lewis Binford, and um, he was part of a group of very rabid uh, young uh, scholars in, uh, in engaging with something that was called the new archaeology or processual archaeology. And he also was very, and George and I were just talking about this last night, uh, one of the contexts in which John really thrived was at this uh, field school in East Central Arizona, uh, where he did his dissertation research and worked with um, many different students, many of whom came to be some of the leaders of most of North American archaeology. Uh, well, and everybody now retired. Uh, but um, major figures uh, in, in the discipline. It was a field school run by Paul Martin of the um, field, field Museum of Chicago. And it was an intense involvement, this new archeology span in issues of epistemology, explanation, systems theory, and the philosophy of science. But already for John and others, they were intrigued by what 
we might call quote unquote beyond subsistence. They were already interested in the ideational or the uh, cognitive and uh, symbolic aspects of human life. And in 1978, a mere 46 years ago, uh, John wrote a classic chapter called Paleopsychology Today, Ideational Systems and Human Adaptation in Prehistory. And this analyzed the architectural design of the site in North, North New Mexico of Chaco Canyon. And so coming to a place, as George will discuss, like Humpy, like the layout of this amazing city uh, there in um, South Central India, uh, John was really sort of already having a, a way to think about how worldviews are played out in architectural uh, forms. And so based on that 1978 chapter, John was then invited to a conference uh, at Cambridge University in 1980, which led to the book called Structural and Symbolic Archaeology. And it was after that conference that John had been told he should go to London and meet this guy, George Michel. And they met, and then George, take it from there. <laughs> With the research, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, George. Am I in the right position? Right. Yeah, <laughs> okay. So it's the story of two lives. Um, Meg has outlined um, the career of John Fritz. And so John arrives in London in 1980. Um, he didn't know anybody. We had a mutual friend, got in touch with me. Now my story, having um, given up uh, trying to be an architect, I wasn't very good at that, but I had been to India halfway through my studies from Australia and got fascinated with Asian culture. It's the 1960s, you can understand it at that period, you know, us backpackers. So we were in India, Nepal, uh, Cambodia, came back to Melbourne, very dull after all those exciting places and decided that I would like to learn more about Indian history and Indian architecture and the visual arts. And I was advised that this, I could not do that in Australia. I had to leave Australia. And one of the places I could go, which I did go to, was something called the School of Oriental and African Studies, SOAS, at the University of London. And then I um, pursued what became a PhD. I, I documented and studied um, seventh and eighth century temple architecture in what became Karnataka. It was my source state then. And then I started a series of projects. Um, I didn't, I took people around India to earn some money, but I didn't have a regular teaching degree, but I had time to do projects and publish them. And one of the people I published with was a magazine, a sort of an art book magazine in Bombay called Marg. And they were, they were really very prominent. And I had sort of gone to this place called Hampi Vijanagara, which was very large, very hot, very uncomfortable. But there was something about it that was different to all the other historical sites that I had visited to do with Hindu kingdoms. You see, if you go to the ancient Chola site of Tanjore, which is from the 11th and 12th century, if you go to the capital of the uh, Hoysalas at Halibid, or of the Chandelas in northern India of the 12th century, you go to all these places which were great um, dynastic capitals, that built a marvelous religious monuments filled with great sculptures and all this. You can see them, but you can't see anything else. There's nothing else to be seen today. Maybe under the ground they will find things. But if you go to Vijayanagara, the city of victory, you can see palaces, military architecture, pleasure pavilions, um, all of the um, sort of things you'd expect to find in a great royal city. So suddenly it wasn't just a matter of individual sacred monuments. It was a whole range of buildings, being some of them being revealed from in the ground, to give you an idea of a great capital. So it was an opportunity to study a city rather than a group of monuments. So I went to this magazine and I said, why do we do an issue on Hampi Vijayanagara? They said, oh, it's too late, you know, 14th, 15th, 16th century. Not that interesting. So, but nonetheless, I persevered and decided that I would have a few architecture students and we would go to the site and we'd make a few drawings. That's the sort of thing I did. 
And this sort of makeshift little group expanded. Sort of suddenly there was a photographer from my hometown, Melbourne, who said, I'd love to come and do some photography in India, but it's got to be something really worthwhile. I said, I think this is really worthwhile. So he turned up. Then there was a professor in Delhi who heard about it and said she'd come. And then there was a girl on a motorbike who turned up and said, what are you doing here? I said, well, we're measuring the monument. She said, that's great. I want to do it too. I said, but who are you? She said, I'm a banker. I said, well, you're no use. And she stayed. And would you believe it? Five years later, she did a PhD in archaeology at Pune. So she was something. So we were a sort of motley group. There was nowhere to stay, but we had a few mattresses. And we slept in the ruins. There was a little tourist canteen that produced the worst possible food you can imagine. There was no bottled water. We all got sick. You know, it was, it was, we were young. We were enthusiastic. And there was this fabulous, wonderful place. We're in the middle of this room. You'll see some pictures in a minute. So the owner of the magazine, the editor of the magazine, who was a famous literary figure called Mulkarajanan, he happened to drive through Hampi on his way to Badami to do some photography. And he saw us all boys and girls, Indians and foreigners, tracing paper, little drawing boards, measuring sticks, mattresses. You can imagine the sort of mess. And he said, right, this is great. We're doing the volume. He just loved it. <laughs> so that got me going. And at the end of that sort of season, it was how I suddenly thought, well, you know, really, I should really go back again, just the beginning. But I did try to get a map of the site. There was no overall map. But at the local archaeological museum, there was a mosaic of aerial photographs. Now, you have to understand that in the, um, at that time, foreigners had no access to aerial photography, if it existed at all. It was completely illegal to look at them. But in the museum, there was this big board with aerial photography because a dam had been built on the outskirts of this site in the 50s. And these were photographs from that period. And since the curator of the museum wanted high quality photographs of the sculptures for his doctoral work, and we had a professional photographer, we traded. We will give you photographs of your sculptures for your PhD, and you will not notice that I'm tracing this mosaic of aerial photographs behind your desk. I didn't ask, and he didn't give permission, but I did it. So I got back to London, spread these tracing paper sheets you know, with rocks and river and, uh, you know, bits of buildings covering about 20 square kilometers. There was a knock on the door. John Fritz arrives. And I said, you know, I said, John, I'm in the middle of trying to work out, you know, what to do with all this space and landscape and architecture and forts. It's all very confusing and it's all very large. And John said, well, I've just been doing this sort of thing at Chaco Canyon. So now let me see if I can. Oh. So this is the landscape of Arizona. Now, you, you're here in the US, so you know this. But if I give this talk in India, it's very interesting for our colleagues and friends there because they suddenly realize that this sort of rocky, um, you know, craggy sort of landscape is also part of the landscape in this part of peninsula India that we call the Deccan. And this was the, the Chaco Canyon. And these, um, you see these letters, these represent various sites, these great houses in this sort of canyon. And that's where Chaco is in New Mexico. And John was very fascinated with this sort of, um, these great, great houses they're called. What you're looking at is a masonry um, substructure of something that would have had wood and thatch. So you, you, we don't have the whole structure. We only have the masonry stone basement. And you can see there are these little sort of shrine, these little curious structures, which people call kivas here, which were, John believed, was some sort of ceremonial place. But remember, we have no history. We have no language. We don't know the belief systems of these Chaco people. But John was able to develop ideas about society and, um, let's say, religious practices. And so he speculated what sort of society would create a structure like this, which was sym symmetrical in mirror symmetry. What type of society would require that? And then he went on to this, you know, Pueblo Bonito, which is the largest of these great houses. I believe they have dates between the 9th and the 11th or 12th centuries. So they're prehistoric in this culture. And the names that I've mentioned 
were given by the Spanish, you know, they're not names of that period. So again, you can see these circular depressions, which are these sort of Kiva type things. Here is a map. These were all places of meeting, meetings, local people met and did perhaps ceremonial, social interactions. We don't know exactly what they did. So John was speculating, what could they have done that would have led to this sort of layout with its central axis and its mirror symmetry? And there were structures like this on the top of hills. This is Pueblo Alto, it's called. So John developed this sort of way of organizing his observations. So here is a, a, um, a south to north axis with various of these great houses arranged in some sort of symmetrical um, disposition. And then you can see at the right, Pueblo Bonito and another one with these half circular sort of um, layouts in a sort of mirror symmetry. So John was thinking all about this. He comes to London, we're talking about Easter 1980 before any of you were born. Uh, we were young too, I have to say. And we, um, we talked about this and John looked at the drawings and sketches on, and started to think, gosh. So we went to India. I took John to India. And at the beginning of 1981, John arrived at Ampi. And this is where this site is, just in case you don't know. This is Karnataka, and this area is called the Deccan. It is part of um, this part of Peninsular India, which is a region I have become very involved with because it has a very diverse and lively architectural tradition, which is interesting for us. Uh, a little bit of history, quickly. Um, Vijayanagara, the city of victory, was the capital of the greatest empire of South India from the middle of the 14th to the middle of the 16th centuries. It was then wiped out, burnt, destroyed at the end of a disastrous battle in 1565. And it was never again occupied or built on. So it's a very, it's a worthwhile place to study because just about everything that you can see is up to that date. It's not like other ancient cities which are built on continuously. And the kingdom more or less took over just about all of this area. And all the wealth came up to there. And on this coast, we had Arab traders who were then displaced by Portuguese in the 16th century. So it controlled both the coasts and part of the wealth came from this um, oceanic trade. This is the landscape. It's one of the most astonishing, um, I would say granitic landscapes we have in India and it, um, with all these wild boulders through which runs this river. So John was sort of at home with this you know, great rocky wilderness, which is this part of the Deccan. But unlike in Chaco, this landscape has um, specific references to do with religious cults. So this is something which we can know about. What you have here is a sacred diagram, a mandala, as we call it, with lingers, little phallic emblems, all to do with the worship of Shiva, one of the great Hindu gods. And the river, when it floods, it washes this mandala. So it's like a sacred shrine, which the river itself worships. And then the water then drains out of that. And there were things like this, these whitewashed sort of caverns. Um, the the Vijayanagara site, which we call Hampi, because of a, I'll show you in a minute why, um, is identified with a chapter in the Ramayana epic. Now, those of you who don't know anything about the Ramayana, it's one of the great epic stories of India. And it's all about a dispossessed king. He cannot, he cannot uh, occupy his throne due to some politicking. So he goes wandering in the wilderness with his brother and his wife, Sita. And in the course of their wanderings in the forest, Sita is abducted by a wicked um, demon from Sri Lanka. And they go wandering southward to try to find her. And they arrive at the kingdom of the monkeys. And this is called Kishkinda. That's a chapter in this story. And to local people at this site, they believe this is Kishkinda. So this place is identified with this part of the story. And this is where a monkey king, a dispossessed monkey king, a bit like Rama, he shows Rama and his brother, this is where the jewels were dropped when Sita flew overhead 
in her aerial chariot as she was being abducted. So it means that parts of the landscape are connected with incidents in the story. And you have things like this, Hanuman, who is the monkey hero, who eventually finds Sita and helps Rama get her back. They're actually carved into the rock. So the landscape itself has the imagery of the story. And we have things like this. This is um, what was an outdoor rock later um, uh, built into a temple. And on this rock are carved the images of Rama in the middle, his brother on the left and his wife Sita, the, the chief characters in the story. And as you can see from the saris uh, and the flowers and the gilded crowns, that these figures are still being worshipped. So even though the history of the city is limited, 14th to 16th centuries, the religious um, dimensions of the site are ongoing. And in fact, have always been ongoing. So pilgrimage to these various spots in the landscape is part of the traditional tourism of the site. So the one thing John had to do, of course, being an archaeologist and me as an architectural, was to develop a plan of the site. So this was our first basic plan. Now, um, I don't have a pointer, but you can see there's a river running right along the top. And that, that sets the city apart from the rugged landscape further north. And there are these great temple complexes, these, these, and these, these great um, architectural, regular, rectangular things with streets. Each of these was like a suburb dedicated to a different Hindu god. And one of them is in a village called Hampi up there. You see on the top left. And this is the oldest part of the site. And it's the temple there is still in worship. It's the one temple of the site that was not destroyed and still attracts um, lots of pilgrims. And therefore, the whole site has got to be known as Hampi. But actually, Hampi is just one of the sites. And for those of you who study Indian religion, Hampi is um, an adjustment of the name Pampa. She is the goddess of the river there. She is the local goddess that Shiva marries. And so it is a, it is a meeting of a local goddess and a Hindu god. And these betrothals and marriages between local goddesses and pan-Indian gods is a big feature of Hindu religious life in this part of India. And this is still going on, these observances at festivals at Hampi today, which gives the name to them. Then we have this sort of, so this is the sort of like the sacred center. John gave it this name. And then we have this agricultural zone where there's no evidence of pottery or habitation or architecture. And there, there are rivulets and canals and aqueducts. It's a watered zone, and it seems to have been a, a food growing, a food production zone that sets off the sacred center from what we call the urban core. And the urban core is a completely fortified city of a great irregular shape. The walls run across the ridges, and then when the land is flat, they are more continuous. So it's a it's an urban form that responds to the landscape. It does not conform to theoretical texts on town planning and architectural design, which we have for India. Any of you who are familiar with the Sanskritic tradition of the Shastras, which tell you how you're supposed to build a, um, a temple, how you're supposed to build a city. None of this pertains here because they are responding to the advantages of the landscape. And then in this urban core, which is where we think the bulk of the main population of the city live, down one end is the royal center, which John was particularly interested in, because this is the place where the king, the court, was based both in terms of their public activities and their private residences. And this was the part of the site that makes it very different to those other historical sites we have for India. Now, as an archeologist, John had been trained in dirt archaeology, digging downwards. Well, you can see from this type of landscape, there wasn't much opportunity. So, <laughs> and it became clear that, you know, had we got the permission and had we able to organize teams of local workmen, which was unlikely, um, to dig um, 5, 10, 15 square meters, when we had 25 square kilometers of ruins to look at, 
was perhaps not the best way to go. So John devised what he called surface archaeology. The idea was to go across the landscape and observe every intervention. And what looks like complete nothing, John was able to create these sort of maps, these topographic maps, scale one to 400. These were done by um, a professional team of to topographic surveyors. And these maps were then given to the volunteer architecture and archaeology students that we had. And they were told to mark on the maps every mark they could see of some intervention, even a scratch. Whatever it was, don't worry what it is, but put it on, give it a number, and then we'll mark it. So see, these are numbers on one of the maps details. And some of the maps, which are um, trying to think what the, we have about 280 maps covering 20 square kilometers, and they're about this big. Um, some maps have up to 200 observations. And we have overall 35,000 plus features. You can imagine managing all this is quite something. And these are the sort of things that John asked the students to mark and to note. So he has put chalk around. This is for tying animals, a tie, you know, to put ropes like that. And these are mortars where you pound grain. Now, there's no structures here. There are no houses. Nothing is there to be seen. But evidently, people must have lived in this place. And whatever they built in thatch, in mud, in brick was washed away. So the idea is to record all of these and then maybe reconstruct what population they could have been, where they could have been, who they may, may have been. So this project, this archaeological atlas of Hampi Vijinagra, which John um, devised and we worked on for more than 20 years, is now being completed. John's final corrections, John is no longer with us, so we have a, his assistant is finishing the corrections. And I found a foundation in India to pay for the American Institute of Indian Studies in Delhi to host this, um, a digital version of the, of the atlas, and also to pay for a couple of paper copies, you know, great big boxes of, of maps like this, which we will give to um, in Delhi, and we'll also give to the British Library, which is where all of our maps and drawings, pencils and inks, the photographs, black and whites, transparencies, field noble, everything has gone to the British Library. And we now have a cataloger going through this material. So this was the archaeological atlas project. Not yet quite finished, but I'm hoping within, by early next year, it will be over. So John then turned his attention to the Royal Centre. So what you're looking at here are recently cleared basements of various types of structures. What exactly they were, we're not sure because we're not quite exactly certain how the kings, the royal figures of the Vijayanagara court conducted their lives. But nonetheless, these are the sort of things that have been revealed. There were, of course, these high enclosure walls, irregular enclosure walls. And in the middle of this complex, if you like, is this standing temple. You can see there with the brick tower, this temple. And this temple was added in the early 15th century and it's dedicated to Rama, the same God uh, whose story um, underlies the landscape of the whole city. Now, um, those of you who work with Indian art will know that Rama is very often depicted in Indian art. There are lots of paintings and sculptures and bronzes, but there aren't that many Rama temples actually dedicated to Rama. Always it's a little shrine on the side or a little something here and there. But this is a dedicated Rama temple and it's a royal temple. We know this because the god, the temple of the god is inside these walls and on these walls, nothing to do with Rama, but everything to do with the king. What you're looking at is these parades of elephants, horses, military contingents and dancing girls. And we have nothing like this in Indian art beforehand on the outer walls of a temple. We have little themes, but a complete royal sort of imagery like this. Oh, okay, so I'm getting out of the camera. Um, um, this royal imagery is something that was invented by the Vijayanagara artists. So it's a very creative period. We feel that the, the architects and the, and the sculptors involved with this kingdom were responding to this new moment where royal imagery was required. And 
these parades, elephants and horses, notice they're not cavalry. They're not horses being ridden. They're horses being displayed. And these characters who are holding the horses are Arabs because it was the Arabs who dominated the Indian Ocean trade in the 15th century. So they are the ones who brought the horses to Vijayanagara, trained the horses, bred the horses and brought more horses. And then the military contingents, all with different um, weapons and different um, costumes and dress, probably from different parts of the empire. And then the dancing girls. We have to think of the, Ro the parallel here is really Rome, that you have in Rome, um, which is an imperial uh, city, you have shrines to different gods, and the gods are connected with different parts of the empire. So different militia, different military groups are represented at the capital by the gods that they worship. So this is very important to, to show that all these people are somehow involved with the palace and the life of the king. Inside these walls is the temple of Rama and the story of Rama. So these are the walls of the temple with some of the scenes from the Ramayana. So suddenly, the, is it where the imagery of the god is contained within the imagery of the king? And this is a, a typical detail from the Rama temple. Here we have Hanuman, who is the, is the monkey hero, who helps get back Sita. And above, we have Rama seated under a tree. And notice his posture, the funny sort of uncomfortable crossing of the leg. So he's seated in the royal position, posture, and he's giving his ring to Hanuman with the instruction, see if you can find Sita, and when you find her, show her my ring so she'll know you come from me. And exactly on the exact side of the, this is the south wall, on the north wall, in exactly the same position, you have Sita giving Hanuman her jewel, her hair jewel, so Hanuman said, when you see Rama, you give him my jewel so he'll know that you found me. So this is an instance of where narrative, Hindu narrative, storytelling, and architectural design come together. Things are positioned especially for the story. So having had this training at Chaco, alignments, how do things you know, fit into the landscape, John is wandering through the Royal Center, up this alley, and on axis with the Rama temple. Rama is worshipped inside there. And he looks up, he sees the summit of the temple, and then he notices the summit of the hill above, all axially aligned. And this hill is also linked with the Ramayana story. There, some particular episode took place. So the temple to Rama and the landscape to Lama are brought, Rama are brought together with alignments. And this meant that John developed these sorts of mappings with the Rama temple in the middle and this north-south axis through this hill called Matanga and various other hills and then another axis in that direction to another hill with another episode. So the stories of Rama, this mythical route that Rama goes through the landscape, the hills which are associated with the story, the layout of the, of the temple itself and the royal center all seem to have a sort of coordinated spatial unity. This is one of, the, one of the summits of one of the hills that John was working with. And here's the birthplace of Hanuman, the monkey hero, one of the places in the site, which of course is very popular now as a pilgrimage place. And John developed this map for the royal center. In the middle, in the circle, is the temple dedicated to Rama. And he noticed this alignment, this north-south axis. So he called the structures to the left, to the west, seem to be um, connected with the private life of the court. So he called it the zone of royal residence, whereas those structures to the east, to the right of the temple, were to the more public or male part of the courtly life. So this was the zone of royal performance. And this is something I would say, this is a unique reading of the archaeological record. So this is something John really contributed. And I don't have that training in my architectural history to think like this. So I think this really is what John brought from his early work um, and training as an archaeologist and anthropologist. These are the sort of images of the royal couple. We don't know who they were, no heads and no inscriptions. 
And this is what was revealed in the years when we were at the site. This is from the 1980s and 90s. They cleared this hillside and you have here the stone basements of palaces, of residences. This is in the zone of royal residence. And this sort of agglomeration of structures, even though in the basements, is something you will not see at other sites in India. You cannot find such a thing. This is a, this is a typical palace, as we call it. This is a place where somebody, maybe a queen, a nobleman, a family, we don't know, lived and conducted their lives. All we have are the lower parts of the structure. And um, all we can tell you is that it has levels. As you go in, you go up, 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 until you come to little chambers, which were used probably at different times of the day, different seasons in different ways. Residence, eating, reception, sleeping, and so forth. And here's a reconstruction of how it might have looked. We had somebody do this for us with wooden columns. You can see like a veranda and then little sort of um, little uh, sort of pavilion type turrets on top with these stone basement moldings. So we have a whole lot of these, these structures in the royal, zone of royal residence. And these palaces are entered um, through steps, by steps, with these fantastic animals guarding the entrance. They have a particular name in South India. They're magically protective, and we get them in temples too. And one of the other structures in the um, zone of royal residence is this sort of subterranean temple. Subterranean because it got filled in by earth that was washed down over the years. It's called the underground temple, but it wasn't really. And it's very mysterious, and it's flooded, and it's great fun to visit, and it's sort of a bit bewildering. But it was dedicated to the same god that was worshipped at Hampi. So it means that people inside the zone of royal residence did not have to leave the palace area to worship that god. It was like an in-house palace shrine. Coming back now to the zone of royal performance, that is the, the structures to the right, to the east of the Rama temple, we have this um, building. What you're looking at are the, the, the um, granite, I would say, um, basement blocks for wooden columns. This was a hundred column hall where we think justice was dispensed by the king or his representative. So this is quite an important um, structure for the exercise of royal power and royal authority. And it probably looks something like this. This is a reconstruct with lofty wooden columns, you can see, and again, a little sort of turret at the top over the shrine. And the king himself or his representative would probably be at an upper level here looking down on similar making sort of decisions. And then we have this great platform, this solid structure, which was connected with a particular ceremony. Um, it was known at the time as the Great Nine Nights, sorry, the Mahanavami, known in India today as Dasra. This was the most important royal ceremony of the year. It was a time in between the monsoon, the rainy season and the dry season, when the king worshipped a goddess by making blood sacrifices of animals, and the goddess invested her power in his body, in his weapons, in his army, and his um, animals. So it was a way of uh, powering the military machinery of the empire, and then the king went to war, or went on pilgrimage. So this is a great ceremony, and the king had to worship this goddess publicly in front of people. So there was a platform on which he went, and it was probably something like this originally, with a temporary hall on top, a columned hall, which may have been erected each year temporarily for that particular ceremony in September, October. And then the different phases, the building was built up over the years, 14th century, 15th, 16th, and so forth. So it has a sort of sequence of structural um, levels, but it's solid, there's no chamber inside. It was just added onto over the years. And this is the sort of carvings on it. Nothing to do with gods, but everything to do with the king and the court. Here you can see hunting, um, horses, exotic animals like camels, which may have been brought from Rajasthan. Um, scenes of the royal figure hunting, not like temple art, but like a sort of a royal, um, sort of vital art. And then we have scenes like this with a royal figure. I don't know if you remember, but when we showed you a picture of Rama 
giving his ring, he was seated like this. You see, with a funny leg position. So this is from an iconographic point of view, a way of bringing together the imagery for the king and the imagery for the god king, Rama. So we're not pretending that they're the same, but they are represented in the same way. So for the, for the audience, they make these connections. You don't need words, you don't need language, you have the imagery. And he is receiving two characters who are Muslims. Now, whether they are prisoners, because they were fighting the Sultanate armies, or they've come to pay their respects and make some sort of treaty and arrangement, we can't be sure, but they have pigtails, long tunics, and funny little conical hats. They are foreigners. And then we have these characters. These are entertainers, and they are Central Asian Turks. They are not Indian. And they wear funny little conical hats, which John and I found in Kyrgyzstan, made of felt. They're typical of that part of Asia, with the little sort of ridges, little conical. And you can see they have beards, they have slippers, and they're funny tunics. They're not Indian. They are foreigners at the Indian court. So this is some, uh, an aspect of courtly life at Vijayanagara, that there were lots of foreigners. It wasn't a sort of a single ethnic or religious group. Water management, water um, supply was, of course, of enormous concern because this is an arid area which has only um, one rainy moment in the year. So water was brought from great reservoirs on the outskirts of the city into the royal center and conducted through water channels like this. And one of these water channels had a spout that went into the earth when we first worked there, just a bit of dirt. And one of the, the Indian archaeologists said, well, if there's a spout, it should go into something. So he dug, and this is what he found. So in the early 1980s, while we were there, they exposed this step well. So it's a really magnificent structure. And they found it just like this. It had been filled in. It wasn't dilapidated. If it had been just left, it would have been like this, you know? But for, under some circumstance, which we, we do not know, it was filled in and leveled for some reason. Anyhow, when they exposed it, you can see it has steps at different levels because this is a rainwater tank. So it depends how much water there is in the tank, how much further down you have to go. So if it's very full, up to there, and then if the water recedes through the year, you can go down and down and down. And each of these blocks out of which this structure is made, and they're not that big, they're not really much bigger than this. They have dimensions, numbers, positions, and directions. So like number 56, north, level four. Everyone in local script. And this is the sort of thing you do when you, you take a structure apart and you move it and you re-erect it. There's no reason to do it normally. So the theory is that this was from somewhere else. And that in the 15th or 16th century, the king was on tour, saw this magnificent step well, probably 11th, 12th century, and said, I think I should like this in my palace. 400 bullock carts went, 400 bullock carts came, and they redid it. Seems to be the sort of unlikely, but quite possible scenario for this wonderful structure. And then we have these type of buildings. This, um, you're looking at the inside of a pavilion which had water. In the, it was filled with a basin of water, and it's known as the Queen's Bath, as if this is where the royal women bathed. But because it's in the zone of royal performance, not the zone of royal residence, we think the better way to think about this is it's a men's pleasure pavilion where women bathed, but these were not relatives. These were not the, not the women of the um, families, but other sorts of women. And of course, there's a whole literature on these sorts of women. You know, they weren't prostitutes, but they were, you know, women of pleasure, women of the court, but they were not relatives. They were not royal women, but they were probably royal men in these little pavilions, having alcohol and non-vegetarian, uh, um, you know, it was a sort of pleasure place, you know? And I don't know if any of you are familiar with Hindi movies, but um, every Hindi movie has an obligatory um, scene, um, the wet sari routine. <laughs> this is where the women of the, of the film get caught in a waterfall or in a fountain or in some sort of water splashing 
and of course the saris you know it's one of those wonderful erotic moments that you have to have in hindi movies and it's quite possible this is exactly the scenario of what happens here but the architecture shows already a non-local tradition we used to call this islamic um, sort of influence it's not a word we can use easily anymore but let's say it's 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 part of the architectural tradition of the kingdoms to the north of Vijayanagara, with which Vijayanagara was in an antagonistic relationship, and which eventually they won the battle and Vijayanagara, the site was destroyed. So this sultanate architecture with these sort of you know, pointed arched windows and balconies and decoration is typical. So it's this type of architecture, this is a, um, a watchtower um, surveying the, the approaches to the royal center guarding the approaches for security. And you have temple-like turrets and these sort of eave things like this. And then you have sultanate arches. And the whole thing is built in masonry and covered in plaster. So this is a technique of the sultanate buildings. We have this sort of decoration. This is not typical of South India, it's typical of sultanate architecture. And it's quite likely that the people who did this for Vijayanagara were the same who did it for the sultanic um, mosques and tombs to the north. It doesn't matter whether they were Muslim or Hindu, but they were probably the same people, whoever they may have been. And this um, is the elephant stables, this long, long structure to the right. And you can see it has these arched chambers. Some of them have domes and some of them have sort of vaults. And each one is like a sultanate tomb, but here put together in the, in the long line. And we were very confused about this. We couldn't believe that elephants could live in this sort of place. In fact, they didn't live in this place. Elephants were outside the city being fed on huge amounts of greenery. You know, they had to be in huge spaces. But on special occasions, a dozen or so great ceremonial elephants were probably brought here and they were arrayed in these arched openings. And this grassy, lovely grassy lawn didn't exist. This was a maidan, a, um, a parade ground. It was just dirt. And there were probably um, instrumentalists, drummers in that little pavilion on top, beating the rhythms. And so the animals and the troops could parade. And the structure at the very end, here above me on the left, was probably a grandstand where the king and his most important visitors would be seated to watch the parades. So it's a sort of, this fits into what we think happened in the zone of royal performance. So when the king had um, visitors he wanted to impress, Sometimes they were the sultans themselves or emissaries of the sultan court. These sort of things happened. So it is a sort of ceremonial architecture to impress. It's what you'd expect in one of the great capitals. And nearby, adjacent to it, is this structure. This is the best preserved of these structures inside the zone of royal performance. And architecturally, if you look for stylistic elements, it's a hybrid. Now, when I did architectural history, hybrid was bad. There was something wrong about hybrid. It was debased um, because it wasn't pure one thing or pure the other thing. In postmodernism and post-postmodernism, hybrid is suddenly very good. It's exciting. It's the, it's the confrontation, juxtaposition of different things, of different elements. And here we have these curved, you see, overhangs on two levels. This is... Um, typical of temple architecture. And we have these towers, you can see in these layer sort of layers, these are typical of temples. And then you have these arched openings with these lobes, this sort of thing, this is sultanate. And then you have a temple-like base. So it's a sort of, I think, a very successful um, admixture of different um, stylistic elements from different traditions. And you may ask, why did they create this? What is this sort, of, uh, this sort of fusion of different elements doing? And so one of the ideas that we, we developed was that kings in this culture tried to be universal. They tried to encompass all the worlds that they knew about. They had different women in their court, different animals in their menagerie, different objects they collected, and their architecture also reflected all the worlds that they knew about. So to encompass the Deccan sultans 
and the Deccan and South Indian temples was a way of saying, right, in a, inside our world, we show everything. And this architecture is only found in the zone of royal uh, performance, a little bit in the zone of royal residence, but only in the palace part of the city. It's a royal style. It's controlled by the king. It was created by the king. And it's called today the Lotus Mahal. And if you go by the signage in this part of the site, you'll learn that this is the Zanana, the abode of women. But we who follow John's interpretation of the zone of royal performance with the elephant stables and all the military things know that this can't be true. And in the earliest map of the site, this structure is called a um, council hall. And we think this probably comes much nearer the original purpose. So this is an early label, which we would like to resuscitate and give up the Lotus Mahal. So that is the, if you go to the site, this is the star piece. If you like the star piece of architecture, the best preserved building we have in the zone of royal performance. And here is John, John Fritz in front of the Lotus Mahal, welcoming you to, to this part of Humpy. And if you want to read more about what John and I have um, decided about the site, we have done a, an illustrated guidebook, which um, has had a good life. Thousands of copies get sold each year, and you cannot get paper copies of it here in the US, but you can get an ebook version. If you go into the Deccan Heritage Foundation site, you can buy it. I don't think it costs very much and read all about what I've been talking about and more. Thank you. Will you take some questions? Um, I'm just sort of curious about the habit of, of leveling. I mean, this is clearly a phenomenal city that then lost a war and was leveled. Why don't why didn't the enemy take over all the investment and just you know kill all the people, maybe? But why did they just did they need well, they, to destroy they, it as part of the battle? They, they lost a battle away from the city, oh. and then they pillaged the city, burnt the city. I think the city was sacked. I think by the time they arrived, the court had removed the treasury, quite likely, and they moved south and established. A, but the sultans or the armies of the sultans did not stay. They did not establish a capital there because this often happens. They occupy, it becomes their capital. This didn't happen. The site was abandoned. Um, one reason was that it was in, uncomfortably in between these two zones, and they retreated back to their center, Gulbarga, Bidar, Bijapur, those places. Those were abandoned, basically. It was abandoned, and we have a few eyewitness reports of tigers roaming through the ruins. And when you came back, was this, again, just a, a desolated area with nothing going on? Well, the structures that I showed you were standing, yeah. but some of these palaces had not yet been cleared. So there was quite a lot of clearing work in the late 70s, 80s, and 90s. So the site became more lively with the, with the basements of palaces. But there weren't people living on that land? Or... No, there weren't really. There were some farmers, you know, there was a bit of irrigation. It was not much was happening. There wasn't much tourism. There was a bit of pilgrimage. We're talking about the late 70s, early 80s. And then population grew. People in India got more prosperous, trains, and roads, all this developed, and now there's an enormous footfall. It's mm. become one of the great sites. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and they estimate up to 40,000 people a day wow. in, the, in the season. So it's, it's a different place than it used to be. But it, it never became a living place again. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask about the masonry um, and just the, the stone. Do we have any evidence of mines or quarries um, for, I guess, pulling these huge amounts of what kind of stone do it's they granite. use? The whole landscape granite. is granite and the stonework is granite and it all comes from the site. So the temples look like they belong to the site because, in fact, the material. And we do have quarried sites and big boulders which have been, you know, sliced. And they use this thing of making little holes in a line. You put in wooden wedges, you wet the wooden edges, and you split the rock. Because the rock is so evenly grained, it splits quite com you know, comfortably. But the bricks and the plaster, that's something else. But the granite is, it's local. 
on the, there's no shortage of it. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this really interesting talk. I wanted to ask, I guess, so one thing, I'm just curious about this, when you think about other sites, you, yeah, you think of temple complexes in India, you don't think of royal capitals or even really cities for that matter. We don't have like city sites, at least as far as I know of in the same way. So like who lived there? Was it only like the royal court and their kind of permanent residence or was there, or was there like houses of like normal people, the servants, farmers? I'm just wondering that sort of thing there. And then one other question I had, sorry, I have way too many questions about this. Uh, the hall the hall that you show with the pillars, that looks very much like a Divan -e Am from like Northern India. So do you find that same sort of Islamicate culture in both sides, in both the kind of private residences and this more public facing side, do you find mixes of Islamicate architecture? And then one last question, in the hunting thing, sorry, in the hunting thing, uh, you know the founding story of Vijayanagara is when the when the rat chases away the dog. The is that hare, the yes, is yes. that the story that was being it, shown it's there? A, it's a story that everybody uses in India. Many yes. sites have yeah. this story, of course. Yes. So that's the yes, it has a founding story. But um, just to go off and tell, people always ask, why was this enormous great city, which had this reputation of being the most powerful and wealthy part of it, founded here in the middle of this wilderness? What is it doing there? This is you know. And it would seem that the people who created this city, the first rulers, were local boys. And they were local nobodies. And what the history is that the sultans from northern India came down, wiped out all of the Hindu dynasties that were in South India. And then they couldn't hold on to this part. It was too far away from the north, from Delhi. And so they retreated, leaving what we would call a power vacuum. Suddenly there was nobody in charge absolute moment for these Sangamas, they were called, these brothers, to seize the moment and establish them, themselves at their local shrine. They were from this area, which was, they weren't big deal, but they took this little shrine at Hampi, declared that this should be a city, and very quickly, because of the fear of these sultans, was able to draw all of these areas into their command. Now, houses, where did people live? People always ask us, how many people? What was the population of this city? And there's no way we can come up with any realistic. The Portuguese said it was the biggest city they ever had seen, but they hadn't seen very much. I mean, you know, I mean, Lisbon, what was Lisbon in the 16th century? You know, it can't have been very big, or even Rome for that matter. But this must have had hundreds of thousands of people. And remember when the king went away on pilgrimage, on war, with the army, with the court, the whole population must have gone right down. So there must have been this shifting population. And from John's archaeological atlas, we hope to get an idea of where the population would have been. But these houses have disappeared. They would have been in, in the materials that would not have withstood the weather. And you've asked me something else, but I can't remember now. Oh, I just asked about the Dubani Arm. Oh, yeah, right. So this Dubani Arm, this um, Chehel Sutun, is the Persian term, by a 15th century Timurid, somebody from the Timurid court of maybe Samarkand, I can't remember, he went on, uh, Abdul Razak was at Hampi Vijayanagara in the 1450s. And he said there was this Chehel Sutun, this pillared hall, this hundred pillared hall where the king or his representative gave audience. And this, of course, is a tradition that goes back to the Middle East. People always say it's like Persepolis or something, you know? There is something going on with that central Asian Persianate culture, which I think is very fascinating. So Vijayanagara is absorbing these sorts of types of architectural typologies, if you like, and rituals into their revisiting of a Hindu imperial city. Yeah. Uh, gentleman, yes. Hello. Uh, thank you for coming to Berkeley and thank you for this talk. I'm a huge fan of yours, actually. Uh -huh. And I've read most of your books. And uh, so very, very, very specific question, actually, uh, about uh, the step well. Mm -hmm. I'm going to set a historian against a historian now. So Richard Eaton and Philip Wagner. Yeah, uh, they they yeah. wrote about this. Yeah, yes. so they, they say that the, the they try to identify the particular site from which, which it came. Yeah, which is Kalyana, they claim, because there are many of these schist uh, pillars in the Hazarama, the Hazarama temple and 
in the uh, Virupaksha, in the Pampa shrine of Virupaksha temple and several. And uh, they claim that this was a way for the Aravidu dynasty kings to claim descent from the Kalyani Chalukyas. So do you, do you, do you buy that particular argument? Okay, so so it's, it's a way of by, by pillaging yeah. parts or a whole structure from another kingdom yeah. you are claiming some uh, some of the authority from that kingdom, some of the power of that kingdom. I think it's quite likely. It's not something we can demonstrate through history, but we can through architecture. Mm. And I think they're absolutely correct in their interpretation of that, uh, that well. So I'm interested in the placement of the narrative carvings. They must have been public spaces because they had a propaganda value. You don't carve a history of your of your family and of your, uh, I guess your, your, your prowess, unless you're going to allow, uh, you know, like it's like a sphinx or something. You're 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 demonstrating your power to a possibly and a, a non literate uh, audience, uh, the hoi polloi. You're showing them of your wealth and your lifestyle. I mean, isn't there? I mean, it's like in, when you were saying about Rome. It's like you you make public art about the royals to show the power of the royals. I mean, so I'm, I'm interested in the placements of some of these illustrations. And I'm also interested in where you found the placements of the Ham and uh, the Monkey King illustrations. In, in this culture, Hamanin is a, a embodiment of virtue as opposed to, you know, in the Rama and the Sita story are it's popular, of course, in Southeast Asia, but he's a playboy, he's a Lothario. You know, he, I mean, a god, I guess, is is who you need that god to be, you know, in some ways. You know, so I, I'm just interested in this place, which claims to be the birthplace of the of the monkey king, uh, of the monkey god. Um, is he illustrated in places where uh, the building has, um, I guess, respectable um, function uh, or, you know, as, as, as related to his character, he's a symbol of of um, purity and 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 uh, well, modesty, as opposed to where you might see him, his image on in 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 Cambodia, where he's he's on a an earthly pleasure dome. Um, well, do you, here, do you understand here, what I'm saying? He's like this. You know, he's in the power defiant posture. This is Hanuman at Hampi, Vijayanagara. He is the bold, defiant uh, power that helps Rama get back Sita. So he's, and he also gets drunk occasionally, I think, you know, he celebrates, yeah. so he's a bit wild, but he's a, he's a hero and, and, and always with his, like this, this sort of defiant gesture. And he's placed through the landscape and often at gateways, you know, oh. where you enter to give, to empower the city and to allow you to know as you pass into the city, you have this powerful, there are other powerful images too, but this Rama temple that I was discussing, which is encased in imagery of the king. This was in the middle of the royal center, which is where all the important people of the kingdom would arrive. So it wouldn't be the everyday ordinary people, but in the Mahalavami time, the September, October time, all of the governors of the kingdom, everybody who was in any ruling or military power throughout South India was compelled to come to the capital, pay their taxes, um, uh, say that they would give allegiance to the king and offer their troops and animals and see this royal imagery. So it was a special group of people for whom it was designed. Inside the royal imagery, you have the story of Rama, and this would have been only for the courtiers. This was not a public temple. But there are other more public temples elsewhere in the site that have more of this imagery, which I haven't shown you here. I don't know if you've been to Humpy, but along the river, there are these great, great uh, Vaishnava monuments dedicated to different aspects of Vishnu, which were for the public to come on special occasions. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, I have a question about the, you know, the theory is that the step well was brought there oh, to yeah. that site. Um, has anyone done sort of any materials analysis on the actual stones to see if they were from another area and kind of identify a region that this material came from? And then also, you know, is there any sort of ongoing work and research at the site and what kind of the focus of it is right now? Okay, let's tackle the step well. 
Uh, the step well is built of a, a chloritic schist. It's a material not found at Humpy, but about 150 kilometers away, there are a group of monuments with step wells, which are of this material because it's locally available. And they, they are stylistically related and they're of the 11th, 12th century earlier phase. So there's every reason to believe that that step well was brought from that zone, you know? Now whether, I think the schist is something which is very particular, it's only found in a particular area. So that's an argument that supports this view that uh, Wagner and Eaton um, have written about, um, which we, we sort of agree with, you know? Now you asked about ongoing research. Now John Fritz is no longer with us and I'm not doing any research. My job is to finish off what we did. Um, I would say that the type of surveying work that we did, that sort of 20 plus years of field work, that doesn't happen anymore, you know? But the local archeologists, the state government and central government archeologists, they're still fiddling with the site. They are um, doing sort of reconstructions and interventions, some of which are acceptable and others we don't feel very comfortable about. They can't leave the site alone. One of the reasons being that there's a lot of money. So when there's a lot of money available, the site is, risk, is at risk. When there's no money, nothing happens. But when there's money, and of course, if you build um, fences and walls and water towers and gardens, you do all this sort of stuff around the monuments and you fix up propped columns and you put steel beams in, you're using up money and people are engaged at the site. So this goes on, but I don't know if there's much intellectual engagement with interpreting the site. We don't have much idea. And I don't think there's, I don't think the generation of scholars today wouldn't do what we did. We belong to another sort of era of tent, young volunteers running around the site, you know, with measuring tapes and tracing paper and, you know, little drawing boards, all that sort of, it's a very 19th century way of operating. And we got a lot of work and we have here somebody who used to be a young man working at the site, but now he's 61, I think he said, so. <laughs> who was part of our team in the early 1980s. So I don't think anybody does this sort of thing in India, not only at Humpy, but nowhere. It's something, it doesn't happen anymore. Yeah. But I think that exposure of years and years of walking around the site, you know, gave us insights that you can't get the hang of the site from a, a, a visit. Oh, yes. Uh, yes. So I was in Humpy earlier this year, so I guess uh, I was traveling around what would have been the neighborhoods of Vijayanagara. So uh, my question was, on the map I saw that, uh, I guess the Humpy neighborhood was kind of detached from the rest. So I was wondering if there was a, uh, so first of all, I was wondering, did that area come first uh, before the rest of the city or perhaps after? Uh, or is there any other reason that it's a bit detached from the rest? And secondly, uh, did something like that affect why Humpy also ended up as the most preserved part, uh, preserved part of the whole city? I don't understand you very clearly, but something about being detached, what well, the city was? Uh, so on the map, Humpy was kind of detached from the rest of the city. The, the village of Humpy yeah. itself, yeah. So you want to know about the relationship of Humpy to the whole site? Yeah, I guess. Uh, did it come earlier or yes, something? Yes, okay. So Humpy, yeah. that, that village, which was and still exists as Humpy, that has an earlier history. That has a pre-Vijanagara history. This was a sacred site where Pampa, the local goddess, was worshipped by Virupaksha, and where the first um, Vijanagara kings, the Sangamas, established their kingdom. This is where it began. So this cult, this uh, worship of these gods and goddess at Humpy continues to this day. So that has a sort of a life that predates and postdates Vijayanagara, which is one reason why the whole place is known as Humpy, which is easier to say than Vijayanagara, the city of victory. So Humpy has a, a had a, if any of you have been there, you will know it had a bazaar street, a street leading up to the temple filled with shops and uh, places to eat, places to stay, places to hang out. It was very lively and very messy. And these shops were the livelihood of the people of the village of Humphrey. They, they, their livelihood were the visitors, the pilgrims and the tourists. 
and the hippies and the hangouts and what have you. <laughs> you know, it was quite a place. And um, they inhabited the ancient structure of the bazaar, the colonnades, the granite colonnades. But a few years ago, a local um, commissioner decided that these were illegal and the whole thing was ripped out. People lost their residences, their livelihoods, and now it's a sort of desolate, empty street leading to the temple and not something we feel good about because it was really wonderful before and much loved by visitors. I don't know if you've been there, but that's how it was. Yes, yes. I wanted to come back to the question of water. <clears throat> sort of really important, I think, as you mentioned in these desert sort of settlement cities. And um, John would have had the same problem in questions uh, in Chaco Canyon, but I'm one, you mentioned about water in, and I know you had a big team. Right. Um, well, it's looking one of the at reasons them. why this city could exist because there was a river there and the river loses height in this area. You know, it slightly slopes down, which gives you opportunities for taking off channels at upper levels and running them and then putting water down, running them into fields. So there's this whole sort of irrigation system that is possible at this site. And that's one of the reasons why a city was possible because of the water. You're absolutely right. And the water management, you saw some of the channels. We had an archeology span student from Cambridge, UK, who did his PhD on hydraulics of the Royal Center and examined all the evidences for it. And how did the water flow and all that sort of thing. I think one of our PhD students, Cathy Morrison, oh, is yes, also, also in... working on water. Yes, and she worked and... especially in the greater region. <clears throat> right. Um, yes. One of the aspects of water that um, people even with Roman archaeology don't really, I think, give enough attention to is what happens to the water that's going out. Where does it go? Yes, the sewage. I don't think I can answer that. As, as an architect, that should yes. be very important. But I mean, it? the um, I think in village India, you know, sewage, human waste is plowed back into the fields. You know, I think there's a whole history of right. this. Yeah. And many of these water structures that I showed do have inlets, um, you know, pipes leading water in, and then outlets. And sometimes we can trace where the water was led to. But there, yes, it's a whole water technology. And Kathy and Carla did this survey around the central right. part of the city, mapping all the um, areas which could be um, put over to agriculture because of water storage. Mostly it's, it's, it's rainwater tanks. That is the main thing outside the city. Right. Yeah. And maintaining them. Yeah, and, and, and creating them. Sometimes they failed, right. you know, all the problems of, of uh, yes. Thank you, George. I wanted to ask about the, the many uh, diagrams and drawings that are currently in our atrium after the talk. Mm -hmm. People can go and see them. Are they prepared for this book or were they for another uh, they were prepared for various publications, but the first thing we did um, was to publish the architectural drawings and maps of the Royal Center. Mm -hmm. And we used these ink drawings, which was a selection from our pencil drawings, because they'd never been done before. Yes. Yeah, so some of the drawings that we have out there are from that first publication, which must have been in the mid 80s, I think, mm -hmm. with Arizona Press, I think, State Press, we did. Melbourne and Arizona, yeah. And you mentioned about redoing City of Victory. Yeah, well, we've done this wonderful book, we think wonderful, with black and white photographs, which you can see outside with gorgeous uh, photographs by uh, this uh, John Gollings, our photographer. Yes, yes. So this came, out, this came out 30 years ago. And the story is, uh, somebody I studied architecture with called John Gollings, um, who didn't quite finish, because he got wrapped up in architectural photography, and which he's still doing. And I always wanted him to come to India. When I would go home and visit Melbourne, he'd say, what are you doing? So he's one day said, I think I told you, I'd love to come to India, but it's got to be something worth photographing. So then I said, I think you should come because we've got Vijanagra, because I think it really is. And of course it wasn't published much, so that I couldn't really show him all these things I've showed you, but he did come and he took these photographs and then he got involved in 19th century black and white photography 
because we found all these early photographs of Humpy, and he went and did repro photographs, you know, exactly the same point today as against 1856. And he developed this technique and this aesthetic of large format black and white photography. Also, the, the, um, the technique of opening up the camera at night and flashing the building building up the flashes on a long, long exposure. And some of the photographs in this book are like that. So John said, and we were never able to pay him. Of course, we didn't, couldn't pay him a fee. We couldn't, we couldn't pay his air, you know, it was hopeless financially. But he, what he wanted was to be published by Aperture. And Aperture is a photographic gallery and publishing house in New York, which is you know, top notch for photography. So he said, you know, I want to be connected with Aperture. So I made an appointment with all of John, well, a selection of John's great photographs to, to go and see somebody at Aperture. It was probably the number three, you know, wasn't the number one. I got there and I was stood up. There was nobody there. So I was leaving New York. I thought, well, I'll just leave this folio picture. What am I going to do with them? So six months later, I call up and I say, you know, um, I came here six months ago and I left and I said, oh, they said, we've got these photographs, we've looked at them, they're absolutely wonderful, but we have no idea what they are. Will you come and tell us about them? And the result was this book. And that came out 93, I think, or 94. So it's a long time ago. So now we are going to redesign it, reissue it, but with exactly the same photographs, and I've updated, corrected the text just a little bit. So that's something we're in the process of doing at the moment. So it's another little wrap up of the project, so I hope to be there. Anyhow, thank you all for your questions. It's really great. Yes, 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 thank you.